you're looking at the Gulf of Mexico, home of the largest dead zone in the US. What's a dead zone? I'm glad you asked. To get the answer, I talk with Stephen Thur at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, more commonly known as NOAA. A dead zone is a place in the, the aquatic environment where very little life is present because there is little oxygen. The size of the dead zone changes from year to year and can grow as large as Massachusetts. Most organisms um, can survive moderate amounts of low oxygen water, but if it's too extensive or too severe, it will kill most organisms in that bottom water. So what causes this thing? It's something so small, the naked eye can't even see it. Our waters have um, microscopic organisms called algae that live in them naturally. They need sunlight and fertilizer and warm temperatures to grow. And so when we have an abundance of those three things, the algae grow a lot, and that can be a problem. A problem that's killing marine life, and lots of it. But here's the thing. This isn't a completely random phenomenon. Humans are a big part of the problem. More specifically, farms, located hundreds of miles away. In the center of our country, the Mississippi watershed, we are applying nutrients to our farm fields. We have large livestock operations. We put fertilizer down on our lawns each spring. The plants in the field don't use up all of the nutrients. That's what's running off into our waterways, eventually ending up offshore of Louisiana. The primary nutrients that we're concerned about are nitrogen and phosphorus. They're the two big building blocks that both our row crops need, but also algae love. He's right. The U.S. Geological Survey just found that the highest total of nitrogen and phosphorus come from the country's Corn Belt. That includes Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, and other parts of states that sit along the Mississippi River. That agricultural runoff finds its way to the Gulf of Mexico and creates a chain reaction of events that eventually leads to hypoxia, a fancy term for water with very little oxygen. Just like we need oxygen to breathe, so do those critters, um, fish, crabs, clams, oysters, shrimp. And if you are uh, one of those organisms and you have the ability to swim, you can generally swim to um, parts of the water body that have more oxygen. Organisms that can't swim very much, think of oysters, which are pretty much sessile, they're gonna stay right there on the bottom, um, they can be killed. Farmers need to understand that what is happening on their farm has several repercussions downstream. I am a fifth generation farmer. My ancestors homesteaded here in the 1870s, and I'm very proud of that, and I'm proud to continue the legacy that they left for, for me and the next generations to come. A legacy that's changing with time and keeps the environment in mind. We are in a, in a journey right now of, of transitioning the whole farm to organic. So we are doing this with zero inputs, no tillage, no inputs of any kind. And we're trying to work with a symbiotic relationship with mother nature. See, it's just amazing. See, look at that earthworm right there. We use zero inputs now. We have not applied any P or K, which is phosphorus or potassium, in seven years on this farm. We've not applied any ag lime in seven years, and we're now heading into year three, where we've not uh, applied any synthetic nitrogen. By eliminating the synthetic fertilizers, we've eliminated any chance of runoff of those synthetic fertilizers into the waterways, into the creeks, the rivers, the streams, and wind up then in the Gulf of Mexico. Cover crops are like a sponge. So they absorb water, they absorb nutrients. When it comes to the filtering aspect, it brings nitrogen out, um, phosphorus out. So when the water does pass through, it is a cleaner product in the end than what it was before. Brian works at the Illinois Department of Agriculture. He helped launch the state's cover crops premium discount program in 2019. 
the program fits right into our nutrient loss reduction strategy, just like we're sitting here talking about is trying to shrink in the dead zone in the Gulf. So, and cover crops are one of the best conservation practices to get the job done the fastest. With the program, it is a $5 an acre discount to the farmer's crop insurance. Over the past few years, several states have adopted similar programs to help reduce agricultural runoff. To fill the gaps for states that don't, organizations like the Midwest Cover Crops Council exist. I'm very happy to talk about the Midwest Cover Crops Council. It's kind of like, you know, a child. Dr. Eileen Kladivko is one of the council's founders. We started in 2006 and we started with three or four of us researchers in the Midwest who were researching cover crops, uh, but there wasn't that much activity going on in cover crops in the mid 2000s. And we knew that cover crops uh, could be very beneficial for water quality, which was the thing we were really talking about at the time, and for many other purposes. So a cover crop is going to hold the soil in place and that prevents erosion. And so we want to hold it in place, um, not only uh, for the farmer's benefit to keep those nutrients in the field, but also, you know, environmentally, we don't want those going downstream. The soil is a leaky system. It does not have a pan on the bottom of it to catch everything that comes out. So what we need is living and growing plants because when, when plants are growing, their roots are in the soil, they're taking up nutrients that would otherwise just be lost out the bottom. Cover crops also help build soil health, ultimately producing high crop yields. But there are some reasons a lot of farmers still aren't planting them. Yeah, so the first couple of years, we always like to tell them, you're not going to see something right out of the gate. This is something that, that takes a while to build. It does cost you something to actually plant a cover crop, right? To buy the seed and to plant it. Um, but you don't get an immediate economic benefit. There's also difference in pest pressures. So we've got different diseases, different weeds, different insects that may impact different areas of the Midwest differently. It's hard. It's harder than it would, would appear. Change is hard, but change is good. And it, it, it just requires that first small step and just take baby steps and then you will build confidence and then it just becomes second nature. But it isn't just the farmer's responsibility to help shrink the dead zone. It's on all of us. Once the nutrients reach the Gulf, there's not much we can do to practically impact the size of the hypoxic zone that's going to result. And so from a societal standpoint, what we have to do is reduce the nutrients that end up in the Gulf. That means watching how much fertilizer we put on our lawns, monitoring our sewage systems, even collecting storm water. It may not seem like much, but every little bit helps because you're helping the health of the lakes, streams, and rivers in your own backyard too. We have a shared responsibility for the, the resources we have been gifted with in this country. And so if we can do a small part to help our shared environmental legacy, I think that's important in and of itself. It's very important that we continue to strive to be better. We can never become complacent. It's what we're doing today is great, but there's always room for improvement, always.